Um, so we'll do a little bit of overview um, with that, as well as um, doing some uh, over or do, looking at some of the updates that were uh, recently put into these systems. So today we will be uh, joined by Kyle Miller from DJI, uh, Techn Technical Solutions Engineer, as well as uh, Shaquille James, our uh, inspection public safety specialist for the East Coast here at Multicopt Warehouse. And uh, I am Ryan Carter. I take the West Coast for the public safety and inspection as well. Um, and then to give you guys just a, a brief uh, overview on uh, Multicopt Warehouse here, we are a uh, tier one enterprise dealer founded in 2014. Uh, we also are a, a dealer for enterprise or for uh, Autel Robotics. Um, and then we do have a uh, pretty good enterprise division here where we're separated into public safety specialists, which is me and Shaquille, as well as a uh, survey mapping division. So um, if you guys did uh, want to come check out our showroom or have any questions about anything drone related, we're your guys. So we can go ahead and get into it here. Um, so I'll let Kyle Todd kind of take over on the overview of these and we'll kind of get into it. So without further ado, Kyle. Thanks, Ryan. Are you able to hear me? Sorry, I had some last minute difficulties to make sure my video is working. Yeah, you sound good. good. Perfect. Yeah. So the we're just going to run really quickly over the Mavic 3 Enterprise series because we're here talking about what the new updates are to the drone. So let's first set the stage for those updates. Uh, first off, we have three different models, but we're mainly focusing on two of those models today. The first one being the mapping version, the Mavic 3 Enterprise. That one's having the four thirds inch sensor, 0.7 second trigger speed, mechanical shutter. But then on the flip side, if you're looking more inspection and you need thermal, uh, you're gonna be looking for the Mavic 3 thermal. So overall, Ryan, what would you say some of the biggest differentiations are between like the Phantom 4 RTK and the Mavic 3 Enterprise that you've seen that have been the biggest changes on job sites. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Mavic, the, the Phantom 4 RTK was the the workhorse for mapping, and it was very good at it. It had the one inch sensor, mechanical shutter, RTK, obviously, that would give you the you know precision accuracy on those missions. Um, but I think one thing for me personally is the ease of use within the app itself, because with the Pilot 2 app really being you know the standard for all of the enterprise drones. It's made it very easy to do all the mission planning. Um, obviously having the smaller uh, system in the you know foldable Mavic design, very convenient. Um, and then the four third sensor. I mean, that really is is huge with the sensor size being the, the biggest really for this size drone um, and flight time. Yeah. I mean, there's there's really a lot to it, um, but but yeah, I mean, it's been a great addition to the enterprise series. Yes, it has. And both of those, Mavic 3 Enterprise and the Mavic 3 Thermal, they also have a tele-zoom camera. So they go from being strictly mapping like the Phantom was to now being able to do both mapping and some inspection on the visual side. And then the Thermal for the price point, uh, I'm sure we'll probably get a question by the end about what the pricing is for the Mavic 3 Thermal. But for having 640 by 512 radiometric thermal, all at that foldable small scale uh cheap price point it's it's a really nice advantage to our enterprise fleet absolutely agree yep yeah cool so let's talk about some of the updates that we've been having for the spring we launched this back september 27th of 2022 now that it's been out on job sites for about six months we've been getting some good feedback of what people have been asking for. Overall, it's been a lot of, you know, Ground Station Pro, Ground Station RTK, a lot of the features that might be in there, or even on the DJI Terra uh, for Phantom Series. So we're starting to get some of that implemented. And very first, you see the very first toggle there, or tab, supporting supports the point of interest mode. So with that, let's dive into what point of interest is. You want to go to the yeah the next slide? Uh, there we go. Perfect. So the most common use case that we've been seeing for this is going to be cell towers, but really anything that you need to be able to quickly orbit 
and be able to capture imagery for being able to capture a digital twin, you're going to be able to do that with the point of interest tool. So kind of just talking through it, you're going to be able to understand what the asset is by setting a drop pin over it. And then from there, being able to have an automated spiral around a very specific point. Uh, Ryan, Shaq, you guys have been able to use this over the past month or so. What are some of the advantages that you've seen on the point of interest mode? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that for one, I mean, you, you make a great, great point. Tower inspections, you don't really need to be able to set a grid and, and do all that kind of stuff for something that's in one spot. So having that point of interest mode and being able to highlight a specific you know, object that you need to get the most imagery on, it's a great tool for it. Um, I, I think that the, the workflow of it too is, is super convenient. The fact that you're able to do this with both the Mavic 3 Enterprise Series and the Mavic 3 Thermal, um, fantastic as well. Um, and, for, and for me, it's the ease of the workflow. So regardless of wind, um, outside conditions, it is going to lock in that orbit and keep focused on that asset. Um, so it makes it incredibly easy to just concentrate on a few things, controlling your pitch and controlling your altitude. Um, other than that, it does the rest for you. Um, so yeah, ease of use. I totally agree. And to just keep driving that nail, it's you're going to be able to set up an orbit and capturing imagery within like 10 seconds of flying up to that asset. It's once you've done a couple of them, it's a very simple workflow to be able to just start capturing. And there's not a whole lot that you have to do beforehand of understanding the structure before it starts capturing the imagery. You can just go out and capture with this orbit. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also I'll note, uh, there is a question box here that if you guys wanted to submit your questions throughout, we'll try and address them as we get to them. We will have a question uh, portion at the end, but we do have one here that's saying, uh, what's the, how, how can you freely uh, move the gimbal during the orbit? And uh, I think the answer to that is going to be yes. Yes. And that's something that we can talk about when we go through, watch the videos. It's one of the most common questions we're getting about the point of interest mode. We understand the need of being able to add in a lock feature. Uh, at this point, it, it, we will talk about what it's focusing on. But yes, if you need to override the gimbal at any point during the orbit, you can with your finger. Yep. Cool. Yeah, let's move on here. Yeah. So the workflow. Uh, pretty simple workflow on a couple different steps that you need to do. First off, it's uh, dropping a pin right over the or an annotation right over the very center of the asset or whatever it may be. It might even be like a cooling tower, a flare tip inspection, something that you just need to be able to orbit and spiral around. So you fly over the very center, you press in the upper left hand corner on the blue little diamond. Um, one other thing that you're going to want to set up beforehand is setting the time lapse mode. So once you start getting that orbit going, you can just hit time lapse rather than having to trigger the camera yourself, and it's going to just start triggering imagery. And what's the little uh, pop quiz for both you guys? What's the fastest that you can set the time lapse mode for the Mavic 3 Enterprise? So actually, we were just talking about this. And so for it, it for the Mavic 3 Enterprise, it was 0.7 or 0.8 for the interval. Yep, 0.7 was was two seconds that is correct you're going to want to spiral a little bit slower when you're doing anything with the mavic 3 thermal uh, just because it does have a rolling shutter and the image sensor size is a bit smaller and so to get a really good clear image you might want to slow that down but for the mavic 3 enterprise the mapping side the four thirds inch sensor and the mechanical shutter you can be whipping around towers and capturing imagery every 0.7 seconds. That's one of the nice things about that drone. So now do you, would you say you, so I was gonna say, do you recommend with the thermal, since it has the slower interval timer, um, fly slower because of the digital shutter and for the, for the overlap, uh, would you wanna make multiple passes you think to, to help make, ensure that you have good overlap and, and enough uh, reference points to be able to do that reconstruction? Um, it might get a little bit more, even more confusing to know. Um, it kind of depends. If more data means better no matter what, then sure. And if you have extra batteries, but 
I would say just make sure the very first time you take it slow with the M3T and you just spiral down it slowly and kind of do it in one pass. Just know that it's probably going to take you prob about three times as long to do a tower with the M3T versus the M3E just based off the trigger speed alone. Yeah, that's a good point to make. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, you basically, uh, I think at this point, should I just go ahead and uh, maybe I can show my screen? I We should have maybe tested this before. I can uh, yeah. Over here to you. Yeah, do you have the actual video for that one? Did I send it over? Uh, for this one, I don't think I have it, but I do have the other videos of, of ours. I don't know if, okay. if you want. Sounds to... good. No, let me just talk about this slide and then we'll hop straight into your video. So basically, what we were able to do is just to re emphasize, we flew the drone over the asset, we dropped a pin, we set up our time lapse so that it's ready. We've backed off the asset, and you can back off as far as you need to based off of the GSD or the resolution that you need of that tower. And then you can see now that you have backed off the tower or you've dropped the point, you now have this orbit option on the left hand side of your screen. So if you tap on that orbit, you're going to see point of interest has now been enabled. You're going to have arrows to the left and to the right. And now you can start moving that drone just around the tower. And all the stick is gonna do, the right stick, all it's gonna do is just spin you freely in an orbit. You also have the option, if you, if you take the controller, the C1 button, so your left hand, and you can pre-program this or reprogram, that once you get a nice speed that you like, you press it once, and now this drone is just spinning freely as long as you want it to be spinning. And all you have to do is then hit the time lapse button. And now it's starting to capture imagery. So one yeah. more time to kind of go over what it's doing. If you have an asset, you fly over it, you drop a pin, you back off the asset, you press the orbit button that you see right there. You start moving the drone until you get to a speed of orbit that you like and you can lock in the orbit. And then at that point, you start your time lapse mode. And I know it sounds like it's a number of steps there, but once you've done it once or twice, it's this process that becomes pretty easy nature within 10, 15 seconds. And from there, all you have to do then is just adjust your altitude. You can slowly either spiral or just drop down and do individual orbits around that structure. And then as, as well as the, the, the radius or the distance from your, your point of interest, um, you'd be able to kind of adjust um, uh, uh, to an extent, I believe. If you get too close, I, I think it's probably going to get you out of the point of interest mode. But um, here, I'll, I'll pull this video up so we can kind of show you exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah. And let's see. So in this first example. And it's good to show something that isn't just a cell tower. I know we talk a lot about cell towers, and this is a big one for point of interest. Um, that's one that a lot of M3E owners have been asking about, but public safety too, being able to just go out and capture a site very quickly for accident reconstruction, point of interest mode is really nice. Yep, absolutely, yep. And so in this example uh, is actually gonna be where we were in the learning stages and we were trying to figure it out ourselves and it shows the wrong way to do it. So uh, as you can see right now, we positioned the, the drone to be above our, our point of interest and then you see the crosshair there in the middle uh, which we're going to use to mark that point of interest using the uh, the blue little uh, hexagon looking icon and as you'll see here when we play this that we're going to go ahead and mark that point it's it pinned it successfully now when we go ahead and try and, and go into that point of interest mode without backing away from the subject, it's telling us that it's unavailable because the target is too close. So when we're able to back up, get away from our subject, and we can see there, it's now actually showcasing the, the point uh, on screen. So the order of operations really does matter, guys, right? So, yep. so I believe with my flight, and I had messed up that order of operations. I would say, if this is your first time doing it, the biggest thing to remember is pin your location, 
back off of the object and then it will allow you to go ahead and orbit. And then a couple other things, helpful tip that I would give you is objects behind uh, the quadcopter as it's orbiting, you know, monitor that. If you have trees, other building structures, property lines that you do not want to overfly, make sure that the radius is not going to be so big that you do overfly that or run into something. Other than that, it's fairly uh, seamless. And now once we did drop that pin and back away, there's a second uh, icon next to the pin drop where it has the little eye that's looking at it. And so if we did hit that, it's gonna allow the drone to be facing towards that, uh, that subject, which we just did manually here. But once we're away from it, we have that pin uh, dropped, then we're now able to enter into that uh, point of interest mode. And as Kyle was mentioning, you can see how it's telling you to set the speed and then be able to uh, initiate the C1 button to, to hold that speed. As you can see in here, we've, we've set the time interval to the, the point, uh, 0.7 seconds. And from there, once we start the uh, rotation, we'll want to make sure and start the um, timer and, and have it be snapping photos. But it's going to continue this circle around. Uh, either until we stop it or until we move positions for it. This is also done in about 20 miles per hour worth of wind to give you some perspective on how precise it is. So it kept the radius very well, um, considering, um, you know, gusting winds up to 20 miles per hour. Yeah, you can see the wind speed there at the bottom just going up and up. And a couple a couple things to note as well, um, doubling on what Shaq said earlier. So when you take off and you're flying these orbits, just do a height check to make sure that you're clear of any obstacles that would be potentially around you if possible. And then also on the compass, as you're spinning, you're gonna see objects get potentially close to you based off of what the obstacle avoidance sees. So it was showing up a little bit earlier. There's some green there saying they are at least 30 feet within an object and then it went away. So there might've been a branch there. Um, one other thing to note is when you press on the orbit button, whatever the gimbal angle is angled at, that is what, it's going to be focused on. So we got a question earlier about, do we have the ability of adjusting that gimbal angle? You're gonna notice as the orbit goes around, it's gonna adjust the gimbal angle for you. Some people, it's very handy. For example, for RADs, I know that a lot of people with cell towers, they want it to be just focused in the center, but for a cell tower RAD, you could back off of it, focus right at the rad, and then when you orbit around it in spiral, it's gonna pitch the camera up and down to get the entire angles for you. But if you do need to adjust, just use your finger there and you can. But that's why the camera is moving, is it's focused on whatever you set the gimbal angle at when you're orbiting. Yep. Kind of yep. messy there. And you can kind of see that there when he dropped altitude that the camera was adjusting uh, to the uh make sure that the point of interest was in frame so yep absolutely there um and then what i might actually do here is just just show you guys actually the the finished product that's okay kyle i kind of would yeah. go a little but so here was the um we ran this through terra that's showing the the capture points from the point of interest mission and just kind of showing you how we were changing altitudes uh you can kind of see the get uh, the camera angle uh, highlighted within each um, icon there but this just kind of shows you how easy it is to change altitudes to change position uh, while maintaining the the orbit the entire time and so with that being kind of the the, the wide one we also have a, a close-up shot here which you can kind of see the the detail that it's able to get um, it was even able to, to see my back bumper popped out there, which wasn't planning on showing you guys today, but here we are. But I, I, I know that a lot of departments that I've worked with for crash reconstruction really prefer the uh, orbit mode to be able to quickly, you know, get a quick flight around it, get the main, you know, areas of interest that they need to um, record. And, you know, yeah. that's, all, that's all they do. 
Time is of the essence here. And so oftentimes with public safety, you need to be able to capture that site very quickly. And so being able to do an orbit rather than doing a full on mapping mission can be very beneficial. When we're talking about cell towers, um, previously we have the Fen4 RTK shooting at two, two, two seconds per image. And now we're shooting at 0.7 seconds per image. We have more battery life with the Mavic 3 Enterprise. So you're getting a lot of improvements by upgrading to this newer drone on both of those uh, use cases. Yep. And then we don't have any towers near us, but we do have uh, a nice church here that had a, a great cross that we wanted to kind of highlight. So this was a, a second flight that we did that kind of shows the detail that you're getting um, with that point of interest mode on a uh, subject that's, you know, kind of hard to, to reconstruct without a point of interest mode, if you will. Yeah, and I can notice that it looks like there's, you have somewhat of a lower sun angle, you got somewhat of a shadow on one side of the cross and on the other, but the nice thing about the Mavic 3 Enterprise, not to keep selling, but it has a larger sensor size, so you're going to have a larger dynamic range to be able to make a better mesh and 3D model and get clarity within the imagery and in the shadows of the, the image. Yeah, absolutely. It's a cool model. Yeah, it turned out pretty good. Cool. I think we pretty much showed what the point of interest can do. You can kind of see there on the orbits. I did do a cell tower. Um, if you have a uh, tower that goes in and out, and you might have different platforms or stations, you can back off and have farther away orbits and whatnot. But when you're looking at processing, what would you rank, uh, even though I'm probably pressuring you into this question, but as far as making a really good 3D model, 3D mesh, where do you put Terra among some competitors? The detail was incredible. The detail was very incredible. We actually were able to look at it um, versus uh, Pix4D, and it is um, though we will say you know Pix4D makes a very very good mesh. The detail was was pretty outstanding, man. Yeah, and you know, so we have uh, our survey mapping specialist. We have an in-house genius, Ted Creed here, who who is fantastic with this uh, 2D 3D reconstruction, and so his experience is pretty extensive with this software and I've, and I've used it good enough to, to feel comfortable with it, but he really kind of highlighted the difference between processing and the, and the uh, quality of the 2D, 3D models you'll generate within Terra versus Pix4D. Like you said, we, we sell Pix4D, we love Pix4D, but I was thoroughly impressed with the, the final product uh, on both of these within Terra. And the ease of workflow within Terra was, was fantastic too. We sat um, alongside with Ted and watched and it is, easy um so i would say the terra's bread and butter is definitely making really good 3d meshes of very difficult structures that might have a lot of sky and background within the image yeah i and i know a lot of friends at pix 4d and what that's a really good go-to when you look at anything 2d ortho mosaic elevation mapping things like that so not trying to throw shade anywhere uh just saying terra's got really good 3d reconstruction so if that's part of the business maybe take a look yeah absolutely cool Let's take a look at some of the other updates that we have for the Mavic 3 Enterprise series. The next biggest one, in my opinion, would be the real-time terrain following and being able to lower that from the first beta release of 80 meters down to 30 meters. Um, so I don't know if you guys have flown at all with the real-time terrain mapping, but the really cool process is, is how easy the workflow is. So, Ryan, let me ask you in previous experience, as well as Shaq, if you've done some mapping, um, how difficult is it to load in a DSM or to be able to do terrain following with, like, based off of a DEM or a DSM or having to use satellite data? I mean, absolutely. I mean, the thing was, is you'd have to go out and fly an actual mission to collect that DSM to then be able to import that DSM, or if you had access to some you know, database that, that you could pull it from. It's just an inconvenience of having to do an extra step to then do your initial step for the project you're trying to do. So not ideal, put it that way. Yeah, 
and you don't know potentially the age of that DSM, if it's satellite or even if it's someone that gave it to you in the job site, that job site may be changing at all times. And so what we can do with the Mavic 3 Enterprise Series, both the E and the T and the multispectral, is we can tap into the visual cameras and then we can follow the terrain of the ground to make sure that we always stay the same distance off the ground for mapping. Because what happens if we plan a mission for 200 feet, but the mapping, we go up a hill 100 feet, and that's the hill is 100 feet tall, and you don't have terrain following on, you're probably going to have image stitching issues on the very far side because you don't have enough overlap, because all of a sudden right. you're a lot closer to the ground. So mm -hmm. now being able to toggle this on just with a simple toggle and follow something that's happening live rather than relying on an older DSM, it just simplifies so many things. And now that we can go from 80 meters, which is like 250 feet, which is great, but now we're all the way down to 30 meters. So around 100 feet that we can follow the contour of the ground, getting really high GSD. Like I, I'm super excited that I don't have to mess around with DSMs nearly as much anymore. Yeah. Do you want to take a second and and just describe GSD a little bit? I know we probably have some survey mapping people in here, but those that aren't as familiar, um, we might want to touch on that. Sure thing. So GSD is stands for ground sampling distance, and that's essentially every pixel on the map that you're making that 2D map. Uh, it essentially correlates to how large that pixel is in real life. So if you have a one inch GSD, every pixel on that map would be right around one inches. But what happens if the drone goes from 200 feet, and let's say the two, at 200 feet, I think we're right around half a centimeter GSD, that all of a sudden we're at 100 feet. Now the camera's a lot closer and our GSD has gone up, meaning it's gone to 0.25 centimeters per pixel. But we're getting, when you think about when you're mission planning, since you're now closer to the ground, your overlap has been calculated over somewhere lower, and so you might have problems. But overall, GSD is looking at the resolution of the map, and you want to try to have the same resolution across the entire map. Yep, yep. well put. So the I think the, the biggest point is the, the lower the GSD, the better quality. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yeah, but also the more data. So the, if, more, also the more data, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And uh, one question we got here that I'll touch on right now is um, for that terrain follow, which sensor is it using to to uh, determine the distance to the ground? Or is it gonna be the, the bottom sensors of the drone itself? It's using the obstacle avoidance sensor. So mainly those visual cameras on the bottom of the drone. Uh, there's okay. two of them that help out understand stereo distance. Awesome, thank you for that. Another good slide here, just to kind of give some updates on the mission types that also support terrain following. So we didn't just update how low you can go, but also what types of missions that you can use this live terrain following on. So now you're going to, um, sorry, this is mission types that support just normal terrain following. Um, apologies, I'm looking at the wrong tab here. So it's the M3E, the second one down, real-time terrain following. If you look at that, now we have 2D mapping and we can do smart oblique and we can do linear. So if you were doing those roadways or railways where DSMs are honestly probably about the most important there because you do get a lot of elevation change across miles of linear mapping, that's where we can turn it on now as well as when you turn on the smart oblique function where the camera is moving back and forth, capturing a really good oblique map or 3D model, you can then also have the drone follow the terrain. And so the smart oblique, from my understanding, is essentially combining missions into, into one. Is that is that accurate? Where you're going to be able to now do, instead of doing multiple passes, you're able to capture that in, in one pass? Is that Correct. Accurate? Yep, it's going to use smart gimbal control. So instead of having to do the oblique mapping mission and fly five different passes, which would be one straight down and then one forwards, backwards, left and right, where we basically just fly with the gimbal at a certain angle and go at it at different angles. 
uh, now we'll actually freely move the gimbal so that it will capture all of those different angles. So all you have to do is a cross hatch, just one direction, and then it'll go the other way as well. And that was first implemented with the, the P1 on the M300, is, is that right? Or was that uh, something that was on previous models as well? No, that was very first on the Matrice 300 and the P1. That does have five axis gimbal control. So instead of needing to do a cross hatch, it can actually capture all five angles within one pass. Yeah. Cool. And I think we pretty much already talked about this, but now we support multiple mission types with that new terrain following function. Yep. Cool. Now, and I think we've got maybe just one or two more that we want to highlight here. Um, we've got uh, supports customized, the fourth one down, customize aircraft heading and gimbal pitch and mapping missions. This has been another one that people have been asking about quite a bit on when they can switch from the Phantom to the Mavic 3 Enterprise series and upgrade so that it, but it can still do the same job and workflow that they had. And now we can finally say that you can. So often when we're flying a cell, or not a cell, apologies, we're talking about point of interest. Often you're flying solar sites, very large farms, you want to be flying the drone and have the camera parallel to the panels. So instead of flying to so the wide part of the camera, we want to be able to control where that's going when it's facing straight down and follow the long length of those, uh, of those panels. So that we can go down each row rather than flying and be jumping rows if we'd be flying normally. So now that we can control the aircraft heading, we can be way more efficient, especially when you have narrow farms like this, where depending on what the aircraft heading would be, you would have to fly this thing at a really terrible angle and it would be turning around every single time. So we still had a problem. Now it's always keeping that heading, always flying parallel so that you get the good analysis run through whatever software platform you may have, like Raptor Maps or some of the other software engines. Yep. Yeah, that's a great addition as well. Cool. Uh, and then we have the custom temperature uh, measurement parameters. And so, you know, this is one I haven't played with too too much since the, the update. Um, but I did notice because with the M Mavic 3 or Mavic 2 Enterprise Advanced, if I'm remembering correctly, it didn't have isotherm built into it with the custom temperature measurements. Um, that was the, that was on the initial release with the M3T, but I think it's just been able to to be improved a little bit with this latest update. I think so. Yes. So now across all three lines, the M300 and all the thermal payloads, the M30T and now the M3T, uh, you should be able to set all of your isotherms um, and set emiss emissivity. Eh, can't even talk right now. Apologies. Um, but yes. Now it makes it very simple, especially for search and rescue, or if you need to see if something's running above a certain temperature to be able to quickly see that. Now we do have some questions here. Um, and you, if you guys have additional questions, please get them in our uh, question queue here, but I'll start with one here. So for avoiding guy wires with the obstacle avoidance, now, the M300 does have the CSM radar that would pick up on a lot of those smaller wires for uh, obstacle avoidance. Now, with the M3 uh, Mavic 3 Enterprise series, you do have the full, you know, 360 protection. Um, but in my experience, you know, the, the wires are the, are the biggest threat. You know, it's the, it's the, the obstacles that is hardest for that uh, detection system to pick up. Um, would you say that's accurate? Yes, uh, very much so. The Mavic 3 Enterprise does have wider angle cameras, and uh, so the obstacle avoidance just based off of those sensors is better than the M300. Now, obviously, yeah, you can add millimeter wave radar if you need to, but guy wires, I don't really care what drone platform you've had. I've seen every single manufacturer crash into guy wires. So a lot of it does come down to strategic 
mission planning. There are a couple different platforms, flight platforms out there that you can use that have guide towers mission planning built in so that you would be able to set all three or four or how many ever that you have of where those guys are so that you're just flying in between them and capturing good imagery. Yeah, yeah. And I will say that, you know, in my experience with, with DJI uh, systems through the years, I mean, the, the obstacle avoidance detection is, is just getting better and better and better. And I'd be, I'm surprised a lot of times when I'm, when I'm showcasing and doing a demo and saying, you know, it probably won't pick up on this and it will pick up on it. And so, you know, Skywire is probably the, the exception, but it's getting, it's getting a lot better, and a lot more, you know, reliable in terms of protecting your system. So, um, our next question here is any word of DJI will release the SDK so we can use other mission planning software. Uh, I believe, it is available, right? Or it am I is. wrong? Yeah, it is. So if you are looking for other flight platforms to be able to fly with the Mavic 3 Enterprise series, you can uh, load those onto the controller. So I know SkyBrowse, shout out to SkyBrowse, since we did point of interest mode, that's one uh, processing engine that really focuses on point of interest. So, um, but you can also load their app in and fly through that. Uh, drone deploy is another one that's already built on the SDK so you can fly and they just built in integration with the RTK module and there are a couple other uh, flight partners of ours that have built on the SDK yeah next question here is is there a free subscription for the, the DJI apps um, and so for the capture apps the pilot 2 and um, I mean go for fly all those those are free um, those will be built into the remotes that you get with the enterprise models. And then for the processing side, um, that would be a subscription-based option that you'd be able to add in. Now, Terra, I think you can get a 15-day trial of uh, straight from the website. I know it used to. I'm not sure if it's still the case. Seven at this point. Seven, seven days? Yeah. 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 I mean, still an option to be able to try it out, make sure it's going to work for you. Um but the, the, ca the capture side of thing is, is free. Yeah. And then are the images captured in the app stored on the SD card or locked in the app? They'd be saved on the SD card. And that is one of the nice things about this new, the M300, M30T and the Mavic 3 Enterprise series. Now, every time that you start a new mission, which point of interest being one of them, um, it's going to create a new folder for you with all of the images for that mission loaded in there. So even if you reset and set and reset the orbit, it's going to all pile those right in for you. So it's, yep, you just, you can just plug the drone in via USB-C, but I just take the SD card out, put it in. And then a uh, follow-up question on that. Now, does the, I, I think it's a yes, but does the Mavic 3 Enterprise Series have, have uh, built-in storage? Onboard storage. I know they've had like eight gigabytes in the past. I mean, I don't. I know it's not recommended if you don't have an SD card. But if you did forget an SD card and you were wanting to capture, I I, I can't remember. Question, Ryan. <laughs> yeah, you stumped me on that one. Um, I've just always been relying on the having a micro SD card in. And I think uh, I think with an M3E, you would really even if it did have the onboard storage, you would really need to have a. Uh, SD card that's at the proper capture speed because it's able to to have such a, a fast capture time that if it's not able to write that then you're going to get missing data so yep that's good um, our next question here was does the M3T support real-time terrain following and 2D mapping and I think we touched on that a little bit which was going to be yes um, now this is a good question and I might have missed this too but you had mentioned when we do the point of interest how um, once you kind of set that that gimbal angle and you adjust your altitude, it's going to auto adjust your gimbal pitch. Now, are you able to, instead of having to correct it, keep it, lock it so that way when you do go up and down, it's not going to compensate for the uh, point that you had initially selected? You have to reset the... I think if you adjust it, wherever you leave it, it's the new focus angle that it's gonna be freely spinning on. And then when you keep moving down, that's the new focus angle. 
Gotcha. That, that's what I observed as well. Once I recentered the gimbal, it was focused on that spot. And as I went down, it stayed focused as I readjusted. Um, okay. So that would have been the uh, the cross on top of the church where we had to readjust, readjust a couple of times. And then I think the other thing is too is it does show your your gimbal angle on screen. So if you did need to stick at a specific uh, angle angle tilt, then you'd be able to just when you changed altitudes make sure your angle matched which is what you needed yeah we you can yeah you get the live rate out of what it is you can't like input it in necessarily but Correct. um Correct. once again i know a lot of people have been asking about that and making sure that at some point that we have it and yes it's something that we have really relayed back to the product team but when you do think about if you would have a tower that has two different rads on it, you could maybe actually use it to the advantage. So set the gimbal angle the very first time on the very center of the rad. And then as you go at the very top of the tower, it's gonna to be angled down, which is overall gonna help your 3D mesh a bit more too. And then as it keeps coming down, it's focused on the rad and then it'll be focused back up. Once you're done with that rad, you can reset the gimbal angle back down at your second rad, because typically you're gonna have more than one on a tower, and then you can scale down that and the gimbal angle will follow that rad. So I know that people are asking about a lock, um, It's but maybe try a couple different things. And if it worse comes to worse, use your finger. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I have a question here about the Mavic 3 multispectral and calibrating uh, the sensor, and is it possible to do so? Uh, are you talking a reflectivity panel? You know that? I don't know. We'll... Um, this question has been following me around webinar to webinar, even if we're not talking about multispectral stuff. It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, we're not manufacturing multispectral panels. Uh, I apologize that DJI is not. You are able to do that within DJI Terra. We don't have an article yet on doing it, but we hear you. We need to write an article about that. Um, but you can set that if you have a calibration panel. Um, a couple websites that I have heard of them that are supported with the M3M that are also in stock, in and out of stock. I believe Sentara does have some. Um, if you just Google reflectivity panel Sentara, there might be a couple other providers out there. I've also heard of people making their own. I apologize, I have not made my own at this point or purchased any at this point. That's the most I can tell you. Um, but we get the question often, you can do it in Terra. We don't sell the panel. There are some third parties that do. You'll probably have to do some Googling. All right, I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, a common question that we get. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, our next question is about the M3T and if it has the visible light and thermal camera. And so not only will it have one visible light camera, it'll have two. It's going to have a wide and the telephoto lens as well as the 645-12 thermal. Uh, so, yep. Yep, just like you get with the M2EA, except now you have the uh, upgraded aircraft and the, the additional telephoto lens. So, uh, and then the, the price point on that M3T is sitting right at uh, $5,500. Uh, mark with the uh, combo with the RC Pro Enterprise, the single battery, uh, and the hard case with that. Whereas the uh, M3E, you're sitting right around the $3,600 range with the same components built in. And then the speaker RTK module also available for each of these systems, um, and they're going to be sold separately. Um, so I think we've, let me make sure I didn't miss any here, but. Um, Yeah, I think we got it all. So thank you, Kyle, for, uh, oh, one more here. M3T uses the same batteries as M2EA, and that's going to be a no, unfortunately. Um, I mean, fortunately, the, the M3T batteries are going to have get you a longer flight time, but, uh, nope, not the same design or same batteries as the M2EA. Um, but if you guys do have any other questions, we have our contact information here on the screen. Uh, so please reach out to either uh, myself or Shaquille. And uh, again, thank you, Kyle, very you, much Kyle. for uh, joining us today. Um, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us on the webinar. And 
Uh, we will see you again soon for our next episode. Thanks, guys.